Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the bathtub. This is uh, the master bather. I'm the master bather, Scott Bradfield. And uh, this week I thought, you know, we don't, I start off, I don't know why, I, for some reason I keep starting these serial adventures. So we have all these different long-term serial, I think it's so I'll live forever. So I figure I have to, I give myself these long-range projects and I have to live long enough to finish them. So the new one is called uh, Nabokov Would Have Hated dot 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 so basically we're gonna it's gonna be a little space to discuss books that Nabokov would have hated and this week we're gonna talk about Nabokov would have hated dot 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 James M. Cain I don't think he read James M. Cain but if he had read James M. Cain he would have hated him now that's not to say uh, Nabokov is right about everything I think I think he was wrong about lots of things um, but but I kind of like that he had strong opinions that he hated things it's one of the things I like about him and uh, I was just kind of st I stumbled into reading some James M. Cain uh, the past uh, week or two. He's a writer I read a lot when I was about 15 or 16 years old. Not because it was dirty, because it's actually not very dirty. There's almost nothing salacious. They're often about passion and violence that comes out of passion between a man and a woman. But um, there's nothing quite kind, of, kind of sexy about Cain. He is, the phrase that's often used with him, is perfectly appropriate. He's unputdownable. When you start a Kane novel, he has a gift for just wrapping you up. He's most he was most famous for his first novel, which is called The Postman Always Rings Twice. That's got to be one of the greatest titles of all time, especially for a noir novel. And The Postman Always Rings Twice is incredibly short. It's it's uh, characteristic of many as of many things that happen in a in a good Kane novel. And when does it come out? It's, it comes out in 1934. Kane started off as a newspaper man and a columnist, and he wrote quite a bit. He seems like quite a character and an interesting man. I really enjoy it. I don't recommend many biographies on the bathtub because often biographies are kind of full of lit crit crap, you know. It, uh, and this is one of the best literary biographies I've read in a long time. I've meant to read it for a long time. It's Roy Hoops. And it's the, uh, the only real biography of James M. Cain. I picked it up millions of years ago and was always planning to get rid of it because it's so heavy that, you know, I have to move with this thing. And finally, I said, well, I'm either going to get, throw it away or I'm going to read it. And I've been reading about halfway through it. It's really a good read. He, he just, it's no nonsense. It's very much in the details of Cain's life. Some uses letters just enough to keep give us, give us a flavor of Cain's voice. And the um, he's very close to the, the, the creative part of King, how he came to write his different novels. So I really recommend that book, and you could also take it into the bathtub. His first book was called uh, Postman Always Rings Twice. It was made into a pretty kind of cool movie with uh, with uh, John Garfield and I think Lana Turner. Um, and don't, I don't remember who the hell it was, Lana Turner or somebody, somebody quite hot like that. But John Garfield's very good in it. The premise is that there's two people meet and sudden, and there's just a sudden passion between these two. And as a result, they get involved in a scheme to kill. The, uh, the, the woman is working in a cheap diner in the middle of California somewhere, I forget. And this man meets her, and as soon as they fall, they just fall passionately in passion. I don't know if it's love or not. They have to be together. And they decide to kill her husband. It, you cannot put the book down. And what's really interesting, I remember this when I was about 15. And many people talked about it. going through the, the the hoops biography. I'm starting to see that I wasn't the only one who was struck by this. But when you start the book, you get no backstory. You know, I'm always trying to get my students not to give me backstory. They just don't stop. They're constantly giving me backstory. Listen to this opening paragraph from one of the great thrillers. They threw me off the hay truck about noon. I had swung on the night before down at the border, and as soon as I got up there under the canvas, I went to sleep. I needed plenty of that after three weeks in Tijuana, and I was still getting it when they pulled off to one side to let the engine cool. Then they saw a foot sticking out and threw me off. I tried some comical stuff, but all I got was a dead pin, so that gag was out. They gave me a cigarette, though, and I hiked down the road to find something to eat. That was when I hit this Twin Oaks Tavern. I won't go any further than that. We are at the scene of the whole novel, within a paragraph in one sentence. And the man's background, he's obviously an itinerant. He has no sort of, it's, it's a depression era. We don't know how he's gotten into the position he's in. We never do know. I don't think you get any real backstory 
on the narrator, whose name I don't remember. I don't remember if he's even in it. Um, and it's, uh, you, you just can't put it down. Now, there's another thing I'd suggest when, when you go through life. Um, if you ever meet somebody who says to you, um, as I have in my life, someone comes up to you and says, you know, you, you ask them who their favorite writer is, and they say, my favorite writer is Albert Camus. He's the French, no he's the existential novelist who won the Nobel Prize. If someone tells you that their favorite novelist is Albert Camus, just they're totally full of shit. Okay, they're totally full of shit. They, they almost, you can believe they're, they're full of shit about everything. Albert Camus is one of the world's most boring novelists. He was very boring. I read three of his books. They were all boring. He, was, he was, may have been an interesting man. His philosophy may be interesting. He was a terrible novelist. George Simenon used to laugh about how this idiot won a Nobel Prize. And Simenon, who wrote millions of great thrillers, never got a Nobel Prize. Anyway, Albert Camus' boring, boring novel, The Str L'Etranger, The Stranger, which you're supposed to read in school all the time, was basically a ripoff of this. And if you want to see a good piece of writing next to a bad piece, it's almost like the taste test. If you want to read a good novel, read James Cain. If you want to read a terrible novel, read Camus. And the second thing I'll suggest is if you ever meet somebody and they walk up to you and, and you ask them, who's their favorite novelist? And they say, James M. Cain. They may not be right, but they're really into interesting territory because Cain is a really, really interesting novelist. So this book, you can't, you'll, you'll read it in about an hour and a half. You will get the bathwater will get cold and you will just have a great time. It's really a fun, very plotty. I'm not a big fan of plotted thrillers or plotted stories, but he really wraps you up. And it really gets there. Uh, it gets you all everywhere you need to go. Uh, I, I broke out the Manhattans for James M. Cain, so I think I'll. It's a very large Manhattan, but I got a long evening of reading ahead. I got back into Cain because I I read just uh, last week, The Butterfly, which is a late Cain novel. And I avoided. I haven't read Cain since I was about sixteen. So I read uh, Postman Always Rings twice. His, his second most famous novel is Double Indemnity, another very short thriller, which was made into an amazingly good novel with a movie with Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck. Definitely go see this. This is my favorite. My, I'm not a big, big Billy Wilder fan, but I love the way he directed Double Indemnity. Fred McMurray was a good actor. You'd be surprised. One of my all-time favorite novels, I, could, I couldn't put this down, was... Mildred Pierce. It's not a crime. I don't remember if there's crimes in it. It's about a woman in L.A. trying to make a living and, and become successful. I think she sells pies or has, opens restaurants or something. It's been a long time since I've read it. For these lovely old mass market paperbacks that Vintage did back in the 70s, I believe I picked these up. Mildred Pierce, I, I would like to read this again maybe in the bathtub. The Butterfly, I just read this. I sort of avoided it because... It starts off with a long, kind of boring introduction by Kane in 1946. This is the middle of his career. Um, he does a lot of film work at this time, and he's sort of best known for that one Postman Always Rings Twice and Double Indemnity. But this is a book, it was, it was sold as a thriller about a, uh, incest, about a father having a, a relationship with his daughter, a sexual relationship or sexual interest in his daughter. You can't really boil it down to that. It's a very complicated little plot again. I started it thinking, well, I'll just try it. I loved it. It was a really good thriller. And it has uh, that same thing, the, two, the man and the woman who meet, and um, their identities and their relationship is something that the book explores throughout the brief 120 pages. Set in the Appalachian, so it's one of the few, few Kane novels that's not set in California. He writes really well about California. Very spare prose, not really specific, not like Chandler where he gives those beautiful images uh, he, he's very much dialogue oriented. He doesn't call attention to the style of most of his sentences, but he really knows how to move a story along. Uh, the Butterfly is a terrific little novel. I didn't know if it would be. And I read another one, so I want to close on this. This is uh, Kane's second novel. It's called Serenade. And uh, I never read this before. I just picked it up. Manhattan Break. And. I'll, let me read the opening sentence again. He always starts off, bang, right in the middle of the story. I was in Tupanamba having a bizcocho and coffee when this girl came in. Everything about her said Indian, from the maroon rebozo to the black dress with purple flowers on it to the swaying way she walked that no woman 
ever got without carrying pots, bundles, and baskets on her head from the time she could crawl. Okay, so immediately we see the girl. And the relationship between the man and this girl is, again, the kind of driving force. This is kind of a mix of Postman Always Rings Twice, about a crime, and, it's, and, and the relationship of the two people involved in the crime, and Mildred Pierce, which is about a woman trying to make a living. Kane's very interested in how people make money. As it turns out, we go a long way in this book. It's a really weird book. It's the f I gave up, I'll be honest with you, two-thirds of the way, three-quarters of the way through the book, I actually got a little bored, and I had to skim through. There's actually a crime that comes in late. And I don't want to give too much of it away, because there is a big shift in the novel. It starts off as a relationship to this man, and this, this basically she's a prostitute, a, a, a Mexican-Indian prostitute, who, uh, who he becomes in, involved with. And it turns out he's an opera singer who's on his, who's on a, he's an opera singer who just fell off the truck. His whole career has gone downhill and he can't, and he can't quite sing. And if you get into the Cain biography, Cain was himself a lover of singing. He, there was a side of him that wanted to become a professional singer, or perhaps an opera singer. He loved singing and he loved music. Serenade has an undercurrent interest which is Cain has this theory, I know it's nonsense, but it's, it, it, it comes through later, that to be a great male opera singer, you cannot be homosexual. Okay, So I won't give you more than that, but there is, at the middle of this, a homosexual relationship, which becomes, uh, which is kind of in the middle, kind of it's the kink in the middle of this, this, this structure of this novel, that, that is not, it, he, he's very definitely, Cain is very, very, unhappy with the notion of homosexuality. He thinks there's something wrong with it. But he's not totally unsympathetic to his characters. And his narrative character, central character, clearly has a homosexual interest in another man. And that comes out later in the book. So it's it's a very screwed up book. The first half is really good because it's totally sacrilegious. There's one scene where they break into a church when he's with his prostitute. And they basically wear all the they, take, they raid all the, there's a rainstorm and they go in there, they drive their car into this church and they're wearing all the priest's gear and having sex and drinking the, 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 the wine, the, the, the wine for the, the ceremonies. And it's just such a weird book, really well written. And then the guy gets involved in Hollywood. So we see him go through Hollywood and the world of opera. So it's kind of opera noir. And I, I was a couple of passages I want to read in here, but I won't, we're running out a little bit of time. There's a couple of passages where he actually starts to talk about what makes beautiful, powerful writing and what beauty is. And it's on page 72. And he said, I'll give a very brief part. Uh, one of the characters who's taking him on a boat says, I think much about beauty, sitting alone at night, listening to my wireless, and trying to get the reason of it, and understand how a man like Strauss can put the worst sounds on the surface that ever profaned the night, and yet give me something I can sink my teeth into. This much I know, true beauty has terror in it. And they go, they go on to discuss why Beethoven has this terror in it, and, and uh, the narrator doesn't like that type of stuff. He wants happy surfaces. And after they discuss it, this Finn comes up out of the water, this dark water. It's a lovely little description of looking out on the dark water and this creature from, from the depths comes up and skims the surface and goes down again. Uh, Kane really can write. And uh, he's, he's definitely worth reading. If you have never read The Postman Always Rings Twice, you must run to your bookstore and buy this. It's just, you have to have that book. And I would say my second choice would be Mildred Pierce, which maybe we'll take into the bathtub soon. Great biography. Roy Hoops, you did a terrific job. I love this book. Uh, I'm going to finish it in, uh, um, in the next few weeks. Okay, guys, so I'm pretty sure Nab Nabokov, we didn't talk about this, Nabokov would have hated this stuff because he hated any kind of narrative which was just about the physicality of life and the, where the sexuality was actually the driving force of all the narrative. Because for, for Nab Nabokov, there is a, a, an impulse towards this beautiful structure and beautiful apotheosis of all our, our problems into this work of art. And he hated this kind of, I can't remember what he would have said, but he would have had some funny statements to say about this type of naturalism. Naturalism is, is not his favorite stuff. And this is very much a naturalistic writer. James M. Cain.
One of the run of the greats. All right. <clears throat> Next week. Bye.